In this video, we're going to talk about the exocytosis of acetylcholine molecules from the vesicles into the junctional cleft. In the first video, I told you that when calcium enters the nerve terminal, it interacts with the vesicles, causing them to migrate towards the active zones and release their contents into the junctional cleft. And in this video, we're just going to go over a couple of details of how that happens, mostly for interest's sake. It's not essential knowledge for managing patients in the operating room by any means. But let's look at this diagram. So that's a diagram of the vesicle, and underneath you can see the little active zone that we had down in the, f in the first video. Uh, I'm going to bring up a couple of annotations here, and then we're going to try and make sense of all of these annotations. So the first thing to touch on is these quanta of AC ACH. I'm not sure if I've mentioned that yet in these videos. So the acetylcholine molecules are packaged into these vesicles in little kind of bundles, and those bundles are called quanta. And physiologists figured this out essentially by like looking at the voltage changes of the motor end plate and noticing that there was these sort of mini end plate potentials that weren't quite the size that you would get with a full depolarization, um, but were also bigger than that would be seen with like a single acetylcholine molecule which led them to deduce that these acetylcholine molecules are sort of packaged into these bundles, um, which, they, which they ended up calling quanta. And uh, these quanta are thought to have about 5,000 acetylcholine molecules in them. Um, and when there's a full nerve impulse from the motor neuron, um, it's thought that around 200 uh, quanta uh, are released, which would be about a million acetylcholine molecules. So huge amounts of acetylcholine released into the cleft, uh, and that ends up interacting with about 500,000 nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. So it's huge, huge quantities of this stuff getting released into the cleft. The question is, is how does the entry of calcium lead to all these things happening? I've stressed in the last video how important calcium was. So let's just look at some of these uh, vesicle proteins and um, how calcium interac interacts with them. So these proteins like this uh, synaptobrevin here and synaptotagmin and synapse and all these guys, these are all called snare proteins. And these are essential in the um, in the sort of com the combining of the membranes of the vesicle and the active zone. So they all have slightly different roles. The synapsin's role uh, is to sort of tether the vesicle to the internal uh, cytoskeleton of the motor neuron. And that sort of keeps them in place. And that's what allows them to stay sort of congregated and clustered down by these active zones, is that they are kind of tethered to the, um, uh, the microtubules and the internal cytoskeleton of the motor neuron. And that's synapsin's job, to keep that in place. Synaptotagmin here is the um, vesicle's calcium detector. So when calcium enters into the nerve terminal along like this, it's going to interact with the uh, synaptotagmin uh, and set in place a sort of chain events which uh, results in the fusing of these membranes and the exocytosis of uh, the, the ACH quanta. All right, so when the calcium enters, the syn uh, synapsin, this guy over here, gets phosphorylated. So it, this kind of gets broken down and that releases the vesicle from the um, internal sort of cytoskeleton of the motor neuron. It kind of liberates it and allows it to start moving towards the active zone. The key part of this process is the interaction of uh, synaptobrevin down here with the SNAP25 and syntaxin complex. And what happens when those, um, those proteins interact is that uh, the membranes of the vesicle and the membrane of the active zone um, start to sort of combine, uh, looking like this. And then that allows the contents of the vesicle to be released into the junctional cleft by exocytosis. Once these contents have been released, this blue membrane of the vesicle is actually kind of recycled. It's saved and kept inside the motor neuron to be filled with, uh, with other sort of quanta of ACH. Like I've tried to do in previous videos, let's uh, talk about a sort of clinical application of these snare proteins and why they're important. So let's think about clostridial toxin. So you guys have probably come across that term and heard of botulism or Botox injections or that kind of thing. So this clostridial toxin is 
is what um, causes the the effects of Botox and of and of botulism. So there is a heavy chain and a light chain of the clostridial toxin, and it gets incorporated somehow into the vesicle. And it's not quite clear how that happens. Uh, it seems like there's a the assumption is there's some sort of receptor that we haven't figured out yet that uh, is responsible for incorporating this toxin into the uh, vesicle. Once it's in there, these light chains get released um, from the vesicle and they go and essentially attack all of these snare proteins, the snap to brevin, snap to tagmin, synapsin, all of these snare proteins we just talked about that have these kind of unique roles in um, exocytosis of ACH. They all get cleaved by the light chain of clostridial toxin, which at high enough quantities and if there's enough of this happening, that can lead to significant impairment in ACH release and then neuromuscular transmission, which leads to all the symptoms and um, all of the adverse effects of, uh, of botulism. However, this can also be used clinically in a controlled way um, for things like spasticity and we'll do Botox injections into certain spastic muscles to try and improve people's symptoms who have spasticity. Um, and then obviously there's the cosmetic effects that some people try and take advantage of, of um, um, causing muscle relaxation essentially using Botox toxins. So Ultimately, all of these little details are not essential for the practice of anesthesia. You don't really need to be having SNAP25 on the tip of your tongue when you're in the operating room. But it's just kind of interesting details of how this process of exocytosis happens and one sort of clinical tidbit into snare proteins and uh, as the target of uh, clostridial toxin. Okay, see you in the next video.